doing this. Thank no, you very it's a pleasure. much. Pleasure. Pleasure. <laughs> And I know you're on a schedule, and uh, um, I don't want to waste too much of your time. So oh, I think we'll live. You just okay. tell us when you got to go, and we'll stop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good idea. Sure. <laughs> Whew! Yeah. Man. It's chilly, huh? It's cold, and it's <laughs> sleepy, and it's a lot of stuff. Enjoying <laughs> our weather. This is the, the snowiest weather we've had since... Uh, the beginning of of it's winter. That's what they were saying. This is the worst day. It just just hit. Yeah. yeah. No, we brought it. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Mr. Medley, thank you very much for doing this interview. I really appreciate it. Ah, it's my pleasure. Pleasure to be here. <laughs> I brought the snow for you. We do a, a program on CBC Radio across Canada. It's uh, it's called Saturday Night Blues, and uh -huh. um, I. Uh, wanted to tell you how much I appreciate all the blues material that you recorded in your very early days because I don't think you got enough credit for introducing people to to blues. Yeah, I mean when Bobby and I started, I mean first song I ever learned was a BB King song, a sweet little angel, just a flat out blues and uh <clears throat> you know uh that's pretty much what Bobby and I did, blues rhythm and blues, but I my main uh music when I was well, when I was 15, I fell in love with Little Richard and Chuck Berry and all those guys. And then when I was about 19, B.B. Uh, King, Bobby Blue Bland, uh, Ray Charles, you know, all those guys. And uh, I just got obsessed with it. What was the environment that you came out of that led you to finding Bobby Blue Bland and B.B. And BB and... Just, <laughs> yeah. we, I was raised in Orange County, California which is probably, in, the, in those days, in the 50s, it was probably one of the whitest places in the world. And, uh, <clears throat> uh, but up in LA, you could, you could get the radio and you could just about turn this one uh, R&B station on. And they'd play all those great black artists. And, uh, <clears throat> and that's just all I cared about. I didn't much, uh, I mean, I uh, enjoyed uh, what Pat Boone and those guys were doing, but man, you know, when I heard uh, uh, Bobby Bland sing I Pity the Fool and stuff like that, you just go, is there any other music, you know? <laughs> and the material that you recorded, uh, not only on your studio albums, but your live record that shows the gospel side of what oh, you yeah. were doing as well. Yeah. And I, I don't know if that was very common back then. Do you think it was? No, no, it wasn't. But uh, Bobby and I had a pretty good understanding of where rhythm and blues was coming from, and we felt that there was a lot of gospel influence uh, in in rhythm and blues. And besides that, uh, we both just flat out loved gospel music, and we tried to do uh, we tried to do a gospel song on every album, but uh, then we ran out of them. <laughs> <laughs> um. You did Don and Dewey material, for example. You were doing some pretty obscure R&B from, from your region, I yeah. guess. Uh, was there a lot of interaction between um, you and Bobby and, and that's, that R&B scene? Did you get to know a lot of those people? Well, I got to, got to know Don and Dewey pretty well because we stole their act. Really? <laughs> yeah. Well, we were Don and Dewey. I mean, we, we just always felt Don and Dewey were two little Richards. <laughs> and, uh, and yeah, Dewey became a real good friend of mine. And uh, got to know them real good, and just just thought they were brilliant, brilliant writers and and performers. They were real performers, and uh, so yeah, Johnny Otis and and all yep. all the yep. stuff like Three Tons of Joy and and all that. Didn't get to know everybody well because the cool thing about this business, if you meet somebody once, you're, they're your friend, you know. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of cool. <laughs> I also appreciated uh, that you you loved Roy Hamilton because there was another amazing singer with huge range that uh, I think is kind of underappreciated. Yeah, very much so. Uh, I mean, that's where we got Unchained Melody. That's where we got Ebb Tide. Uh, we we did You Can Have Her by him, yep. and uh, Hear That Whistle It's Ten O'clock. Don't let go. I mean, we just we just idolized. Uh, 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 Roy Hamilton, and so did Elvis Presley, by the way. Elvis Presley's favorite song was Unchained Melody by uh, by Roy Hamilton. Really? Yeah, he, he was a, and we got to see Roy in a, in a nightclub, and 
just just blew us away. He, he just had a gorgeous kind of baritone in between that baritone and tenor, you know, just wonderful. You mentioned Elvis and um, Elvis, I think, shared a lot of the same love uh, of the kind of music that you did. Would, would you agree with that? Yeah, oh, absolutely. I, I had a lot, lot of conversations with Elvis about it. And he always wanted to be the black bass singer in, in a group. And he figured I was the black bass singer. <laughs> so he thought I, that, that was pretty cool. But he, yeah, a lot of his, his roots. And, and that's the one thing I admired most about Elvis. When uh, he would horse around on stage quite a bit. But when it came to, to doing one of those gospel songs, boy, he would really just knock it out of the park. You wrote a song for Elvis, uh, Old Friend. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I really did become a, a good, good friend. Bobby and I became friends even in 62, 63, way back there. And then I started working, I was on my own, and I was working uh, at the uh, Hilton International with Elvis. Elvis was in one room. So he would call me up all the time and say, come on down to the dressing room, and all of his boys would be gone. So it was just Elvis, me, and his, his hairdresser. And uh, so I... He would ask me all, he said, how do you sing like that? How do you, he couldn't figure it out. And uh, I'd ask the same thing. I'd say, how do you look so good? <laughs> but uh, he, he was a great guy and he was a, a warm guy. Unfortunately, I think he was yesed quite a bit by, by his people and they loved him to death, but they just, I, don't, I just don't think they knew how to treat uh, somebody that big. Um, and he just got away with too much and got in trouble. The term blue-eyed soul was, uh, I believe, coined for the Righteous Brothers. Is, is that correct? Yeah, well, we, yeah, well, our first record was a song called Little Latin Loopy Lou that I wrote. And uh, it sounded real black. And so uh, Atlantic Records was, produce, uh, was uh, publishing it. Not publishing, they were uh, distributing it. And so they took us out on a, a tour, you know, to uh, go uh, do interviews on the radio stations. They took us to all these black stations because that's who was playing the record. The minute they found out we were white, they took it off. Really? Not, not, be, not a racial thing. Yeah. They played black music. Mm -hmm. You know, you play gospel music, you play gospel music. And uh, which was kind of a, a huge compliment. So we were caught in the middle between uh, uh, couldn't get on the, the white stations because we sounded too black and too raucous and uh, couldn't get on the black stations because we were, were white. But then Love and Feeling came out and black stations started playing it. They just, they said, never mind, we're going to play this. And it went number one, Rhythm and Blues. And there was this disc jockey that started it in, I think, Philadelphia or somewhere, one of those places. He would say, all right, here's my blue-eyed soul brothers, the Righteous Brothers, singing <laughs> You've Lost That Love and Feeling. Well, bl a blue-eyed was in the 50s was, was a white guy. So he was hipping his audience to the fact that here's two white guys singing Love and Feeling. So we became the blue-eyed soul brothers. <laughs> and how fortunate that you and Bobby would have, would have run into each other with such remarkable voices and, and such complimentary voices. Well, it, it was just uh, it was just a blessing, you know. It, I mean, especially where we came from. I mean, we really came from Orange County, California, white, and uh, and Bobby did the same thing. He would listen to these little black radio stations, and uh, when we got together, it was like two guys with one voice, you know. And and he had this high voice. We were should have been a quartet. I was the bass singer, and he was the tenor. But uh, we made more money with just two of us. Uh, <laughs> but he, uh, yeah, it was remarkable. I mean, we would, uh, when we were working in clubs, just playing in the clubs before we were the Righteous Brothers, we'd, we'd sing a song once. Never, we never rehearsed, ever. We'd just say, here's the song, and we'd horse around with it, and then we were gone. <laughs> you produced so many of the great records yourself, and of course Phil Spector is credited yeah. with producing so many great records yeah. as well. Um, you, you said that there was a looseness to the Righteous Brothers approach to doing things you never rehearsed. How did that uh, work with Phil Spector? Did he... Uh, Not did he... well. <laughs> no, he, he worked our brains out. We thought we'd 
we we just did, we thought we walked into hell. I mean, it was, uh, and, and he was absolutely correct. He 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 just didn't stop until it was absolutely perfect. And I think we sang "Love and Feeling" for probably about eight hours, you know, to get to get it down the way the way he wanted. And uh, but we didn't mind because every time he we would do it, we could hear that it was better and better and better. We weren't we well we we weren't stupid, but. <laughs> Uh, we, you know, it was always becoming better, so we uh, let him get away with that. But when he would produce the album, you know, he would produce the singles because he took so long in those days and spent so much money. He asked me to produce the albums. Right. So I would go in and do the, I think in those days he spent $2,000 producing Love and Feeling, which was a lot of money in 64. And I spent fifteen hundred to make the album, <laughs> and uh, so that's how we did it. He would do the the uh, the, um, the singles, and I would do the albums. And our second album, uh, just once in my life album, um, that's when I produced Unchained Melody, and it accidentally became the B side, and it kind of didn't go down well with Phil. He, <laughs> he had a bit of a a problem with uh, with that because he put Unchained Melody on. The, the backside of just once in my life, uh, oh no, on hung on you, and uh, thinking, well, they'll never play uh, Unchained Melody. It's Bobby singing by himself. Da, da, da. Wrong, <laughs> <laughs> and they just uh, started playing it, and they wouldn't stop playing it, and it became uh, it's one of our you know biggest records. Of course, you know the, those Phil Spector sessions are legendary, and there were just so many great players on those. And, you know, in retrospect, a lot of New Orleans players, you know, yeah. Earl Palmer yeah, on sure. drums and Harold Baptiste. And... Yeah, a lot of people don't know Earl played on, on Love and Feeling, uh, uh, Earl Palmer. And uh, Hal Blaine did most of the playing, but uh, he was out of town and, uh, and Earl played. And we were thrilled about that. Great guy, great drummer. So when you took over the producer's reins, uh, what was different? Did you use those same players too? I did when I produced Soul and Inspiration. Soul and Inspiration was supposed to follow Love and Feeling, but Phil got in a disagreement with Barry Mann and Cynthia Weil. And uh, so we ended up back in L.A. working with uh, a pretty little girl named Carol King that wrote Just Once in My Life, which is one of the best songs, just one of the best songs ever. And, uh, and then we split from Phil. We didn't want to split from Phil. A lot of people think we probably... Gotten, he was crazy and we wanted to get away. Not at all, especially me. I knew that it, that job was going to come back to me. And, uh, but uh, we, we, we left uh, Spectre and I called Barry Men and Cynthia Weil. I said, please send us that song, Soul and Inspiration. And they said, we didn't even finish it. I said, well, finish it. We need it. <laughs> and they finished it and they sent about four or five other songs along with it and every, I turned on every single one of them and every one of them became hits. We got to get out of this place, Kicks, Hungry, every one of those songs were on that, were on this uh, demo tape. But uh, Soul and Inspiration, uh, so yeah, I, I, I just I just copied what, what Phil, what I felt Phil would have done, hmm. you know. I tried to make it a little dirtier, you know, a little street, more street, and bring some street in it and certainly bring Bobby into it more. And uh, thank God, yeah. it worked. <laughs> you caught kind of the last of the, uh, the those, era, that era where the bus tours were, you know, uh, there would be a lot of this, a lot of acts on, on one yeah. tour that, was it the Dick Clark Dick tours? Dick Clark tours, did, yeah. Yeah. well, I, we didn't do them. We, we were very fortunate. <laughs> We jumped right over them somehow. We we started doing Shindig, I guess, in about 54, which is, I mean, 64, 65, which, uh, and, and Love and Feeling all at the same time. And, and Shindig in the States was, it was, you know, like MTV every every week. So we just, you know, Love and Feeling just took us from there to there overnight, you know. And, uh, and so we just kind of jumped over that. And we ended up just doing our own, Righteous Brother Tours, we would take uh, April Stevens and Nino Tempo out and people like that, and and uh, we just had a ball. And you played with the Beatles. And we played with the Beatles. We did that before 
love and feeling. If we knew we were going to have love and feeling, we wouldn't have done the two or not. <laughs> yeah, we were asked to do that, and man, it was. I explained a little that on, on the show that it, it was tough because it was about thirty or forty thousand screaming kids yelling, "We want the Beatles! We want the while we were on." And um, so we uh, we asked them if we could leave the tour early to go back and do Shindig. And they said, sure. And we did the first Rolling Stones American tour. And and that was good because we had these California hits, Little Lap, Loopy Lou, My Babe, Coco Joe, stuff like that, these kind of R&B songs. All the songs we stole from Don and Dewey, <laughs> Justine, Coco Joe. And um, so that was a great tour. And that was a lot of fun. And... Uh, yeah, we, we just, it was one of those overnight deals, you know, being on a national TV show every week and uh, and having love and feeling. I mean, yeah. that's all you could ask for. Just one final question, if you don't mind. Um, do you have any advice for people who are singers, who are truly good singers that are trying to make it in this business? Run like a deer. Now, I, I don't know. I don't know what to say because I have a... 25-year-old daughter who's uh, on my show. She sings Time of My Life with me and does a couple of things on her own. I don't know, man. The, the, you know, the business has changed so much, and I hate to sound like an old man, but I mean, it's changed from the, the fact that I'm not even sure there's record stores that go by. I don't know how you do it anymore. We used to go in and make a record. We would love it. We would take it down to the hottest radio station in L.A. and say, say, Martindale, here's, here's our new, and he'd play it, and you couldn't do that today with a shotgun. So I, so I don't know. All I can say is if this is what you need to do, and you need to do, if you need to do it, you need to do it. If you want to do it, run like a deer, because you better need to do it. They'll spit you out, you know, they'll chew you up. It's a, it's a tough business because, you know, you, you walk out on stage, Car salesman is perfect, man, because you walk and say, you, you want to buy this car? And you, they say, no, I think it's ugly. Okay, would you like this car? Well, we got to go out and say, you want to buy me? <laughs> and they say, no, you're ugly. Well, okay. You, uh, then you're, you know, so it's really tough because yeah. you're really putting yourself on the line. So you really have to be committed and just need to, to do it. And want won't get it. You know, getting a lot of girls and making a lot of money, if that... If that's where you're headed, you might as well get a job with the city and keep on going. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Medley. I really appreciate oh, it. My pleasure. Thank you. Can I ask one quick question? Sure. And today I heard an interview that you had done and you talked about um, working in Vegas in the mid to late 60s and how that was a bit of a trip. Can you talk a bit about those days and what it was like? Well, yeah, a love and feeling hit. And uh, we just became big right away. And our agent came to us and said, listen, I want you to go to Vegas and and play in Vegas because it'll be, it'll be there for the rest of your career. It'll be like a slot machine. And uh, we said, okay. <clears throat> and so they came in and saw us and they, they had to go to Frank Sinatra to get his okay because he would take his parties into our lounge after the show. And I mean parties. He would have the biggest Hollywood stars in the world come into Vegas to see him. And he would bring him into our room. I had to sing Georgia in front of Ray Charles. <laughs> and, uh, and so we were there with, uh, we're 25 years old and we're there with the Rat Pack. Enough said. <laughs> but I mean, it was just unbelievable. And it was, it was great training. And Bobby and I were just a couple of years older and then let's say the Beach Boys and 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 all of that. So we kind of had had this training of how to perform from watching Sammy Davis and Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis and those guys. So we were kind of coming from there and singing rhythm and blues. So we so t to young white kids, they didn't know either one of those. They didn't expect some guy to walk out on stage and tell a joke or be funny and talk to the audience. And they certainly didn't expect him to get up there and scream his brains out. And, uh, you know, so the white kids uh, went, wow, cool. I didn't know I was, I, I was uh, supposed to feel like that.
but but, but Vegas was great. Cool. <laughs> you can imagine. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm a record collector, and I'd really appreciate if you could sign some of my records. Sure. Thank you sure. very much. Stubby little pin. Yeah. Is that okay for you? It's a bobby pin. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Of course it is. This is new. That was everything that was in the can oh, is <laughs> that, that we right? hadn't released. Oh. <laughs> and they call it, this is new. Yeah. This kid. <laughs> <laughs> Song I wrote, uh, what, it, was, it was a demo I, I had written for Ricky Nelson. It's on there. Oh, great. Yeah. Well, oh, oh sir, let me that. open that. Sorry. Right. Yeah. I was just listening to that today. Blue-eyed soul. Yeah. yeah, that was before we were called the Blue Eyed Soul Brothers, which is kind of kind of odd. They didn't get that from here. They just started calling us that. This is our, our greatest hit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> One for the road. It's a live album, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Oh, let me uh, peel that back. New York and cold. <laughs> Go ahead and cry. Yeah, almost became, almost became a hit. Almost got off the song <laughs> I wrote. And here's, you can almost tell it's a 70s game. Yeah, yeah. Go away. <laughs> <laughs> Hair and clothes. <laughs> Nice hair, getting in the 80s. A lot of, well, you know, <laughs> when I left the Righteous Brothers, there was these couple of guys, high rolls, and they came to me and said, listen, we'll give you a million dollars, a million dollars in front, if you grow your hair long and start, uh, you know, a, 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 a horn band. Wow. And be a rock and roll horn band guy. I said, no, 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 no. Six months later, I turned a million dollars. Six months later, I had long hair and a horn band. <laughs> Jeez. Brilliant, huh? Uh huh? And this isn't me, by the way. <laughs> My mom had to stick up on me. And I wish this was still me. <laughs> this is my son. <laughs> and the last one. This is really generous of you. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. I've been collecting your music for a long time. Well, I appreciate it. Thank so you so much for doing this. Yeah. No problem. Now I gotta we'll just point that go to work. Yeah. Thank you, man. That's Thank you. Good to see you. Why we got a shot? Oh, no. I don't know. That would be very nice. Thank you. He's bigger than me. <laughs> Hang on. One more? Yeah, sure. Great. All right. Thank you. Is she good? Oh, she's still shooting. Shooting? <laughs> yeah, no, she's good. Thank you, sir. Very nice meeting you. Thank you. My pleasure, guys. Have a yeah. good show. And so you play the blues? Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, God bless yeah. you. I have a blues album. Steal it. Really? Yeah, yeah. It, it loosely blues. It's yeah, kind okay. of more dedicated to the guys I was influenced, like Ray, Ray yeah. Charles and yeah. you know Sam Cooke and yeah. Bobby Bland and all those guys. It's a... Uh, Steal it. Don't buy it. <laughs> <laughs> Don't buy it. You'll be the guy that bought it. Okay, Thanks take care. Guys. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers.